Hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that host of yours who has absolutely bitten off more than she can chew with these upcoming episodes. Liv. Liv is my name. And what have I done? You know, there's a reason I've spent the last five years of this podcast avoiding the Orphic mysteries and the Orphic tradition broadly. It is confusing and weird and so, so very different from the traditional sourcing on ancient Greek myth that even just dipping one's toes into that Orphic underworld water feels very, very daunting. Enter me reading just one or two paragraphs of a couple of articles and already feeling deeply overwhelmed. Or at least that's how it started. What have I done? I asked myself. But you know what? If not now, when? Also, I've already started it. I've always intended to dive into these stories or concepts, really. Sort through them and then share them with you. But it's really easy to put off because, again, it's daunting as all hell. And I was right. But here we are. And I am hellbent on learning all of this for myself and then sharing it all with you. We are in this together. We are traveling to the underworld with Orpheus at our side, and we're trying to learn about the tradition that originates with Orpheus that may or may not have been a religious cult, but absolutely was religious rituals and mythologies and practices for life after death. Because yes, the main crux of today's episode and the next two weeks is, well, there's an alternate mythology. Alternate religious traditions and rituals, an alternate theogony, possibly an alternate Greek religious cult entirely. Regardless, there are these alternate mythologies, with many of the same gods, but very, very different stories from the ones we know. The ones I've shared with you over these 400 or so episodes. The ones I know like the back of my hand. There are even new and foreign gods to contend with. There's just a whole other world. But the reason that the Orphic tradition is not as popular and not as talked about, aside from the fact that it just wasn't as widespread a tradition as the traditional Greek mythology that we know, is that it's really very fragmentary. It spans time periods in a really interesting and additionally confusing way. And it is, well, mysterious. We don't know much at all, and often what we think we know might be a later invention or a connection that isn't necessarily there in the ancient world, or even just biased interpretation by modern scholars. So this episode, while fascinating and super insightful into the written evidence of the traditions of ancient Greek people, specifically this Orphic tradition, this episode is heavy on the theories, the what-ifs, the historical context, and questions. So many questions. Think kind of my Atlantis episodes, but like with actual real mythology and history tucked in. I have referenced as many books and articles as I could get my hands on without spending absurd amounts of money. One of these books was already $100. Whew. But I know even still, I am not bringing you all everything that exists in terms of research on this topic. Not by a long shot. I am also bringing it to you from a historical, mythographer-style point of view. I am interested in the mythology that's introduced, the historical context. I am not concerned with the modern religious religion or practices, nor do I feel academically prepared to theorize much on the ancient religious practices themselves. All the same, it's absolutely fucking fascinating, and I just know you're going to love learning about these bits of the ancient world. Plus, I get to finally explain Zagreus to you, and maybe even that meme-worthy woman, Baobo, whose story makes the rounds every now and again in the form of a, a wordy Tumblr meme. And given all of this tradition revolves around life and death and the underworld, and also Dionysus and, and Dionysian mystery cults, well god, you just know we're going to have a good time, even if we're a hint confused along the way. So let's try to figure it all out, shall we? this mystical and mysterious Orphic tradition. This is episode 178. There's life after death. An attempt to understand the Orphic tradition. 
Learn now, Musaius, a mystical and most holy rite, a prayer which surely excels all others. That's the opening of one of the Orphic hymns, proposed to be Orpheus speaking to an initiate, a man named Musaius. These hymns are just one part of the Orphic tradition, a part that is probably dated quite late, somewhere after the 2nd century CE, though nothing about them or really anything else to do with Orpheus is certain. What the hymns are, though, are some of the most complete works that we have from the Orphic tradition. Otherwise, we have some fragmentary papyrus, we have references to poems that have now been lost, we have gold tablets from grave sites that relate primarily to instructions on how to handle one's journey through the underworld, and which have been connected to the Orphic tradition. We have the rhapsodies, fragmentary poems telling alternate theogonies of the gods, the origins of everything. And we have these hymns, these songs to the gods. But even with all of this evidence, we know very little, or rather we're certain about very little, when it comes to this tradition. There are even scholars who question whether the gold tablets that I mentioned, and that I'll go into more in a couple episodes from now, have anything to do with Orpheus at all. And everything is so fragmentary and disjointed, spanning so, so many centuries, that it's difficult to find a through line. To me, that's what makes it all worth looking at, but it's also what makes it really difficult to share with you. So bear with me. Ultimately, there is some wild alternate mythology coming, some eating of children and thrice-born versions of Dionysus. So, so much of the worst incest of all mythology, instructions for the afterlife, and beyond. <laughs> Central to the idea of the Orphic tradition, or the Orphic mythology, is, as is pretty obvious in the name and last week's episode, Orpheus. That's why I told you his story last week, this refresher on who Orpheus was thought to be and what we know that he did, mythologically speaking, at least. Here comes the idea that he was a real person, or more likely a quote-unquote real person in the way that Homer was a quote-unquote real person. A cultural concept, a cultural hero, even. Do we know that he existed? No. Do we think he could have? I mean, I would say probably not. It's not impossible, but what's most likely is that he was just a part of the oral tradition, a name used to denote the fame of poets broadly, their talent and expertise. He was the best of them, after all, because they needed someone to look up to, to work towards. Just like the Iliad and the Odyssey needed a name ascribed to them, there needed to be a name ascribed to these other particular writings and theorizings. The Greeks had Homer, sure, but they wanted more. As I mentioned last week, Orpheus's name is as old as the Archaic period. We know that Orpheus was mentioned at least as far back as the 6th century BCE by a poet named Ibicus, who called him the famous named Orpheus. So here we learned of his fame from as far back as that, though I'll point out this is still probably a small handful of hundreds of years later than the idea of Homer and that tradition. Again, as I told you last week, he's also mentioned by Euripides in the Alcestis, and that's where we get the idea that he traveled to the underworld for his wife, though there he succeeded in bringing her back. Alternately, he's mentioned in Plato's Symposium, also for traveling to the underworld for Eurydice, but there he fails. There are so many versions where he fails, and not only for the reasons that he fails in Ovid, or they're not specified at all. We just get a sense of how old that story is. How old it is that, that he doesn't get her back. But the key to it all, though, at least in terms of all of this Orphic tradition, is Orpheus and his catabasis. His descent into the underworld, his visit with the Chthonic deities there, and his return to the land of the living. What matters for today's episode is the very existence of him in whatever way, real and human or mythical, and his association with the underworld. Whoever Orpheus was, this all revolves around him and his association with the Chthonic deities. But first, before we get into the nitty-gritty of this tradition, I want to add a caveat. As you all know, I am not a scholar by any stretch. I am just an enormous nerd who reads everything and speaks to scholars about their scholarliness. <laughs> I myself have a 10-year-old BA, and thus am not deep in the realm of sorting through what research or theories are current. I am doing my best 
as is the brilliant Michaela, who provided absolutely invaluable research on this topic and who thankfully is a student and thus remembers more about researching in that realm than I do and has access to university resources. Regardless, though, we are only human. This is by no means a full examination of the Orphic tradition or even the Orphic question. That is, what actually was going on? See, because it seems very difficult to determine what the current consensus is in terms of Orphism or Orphic tradition. Was it actually a religious cult? Was it a vague religious tradition that might have been practiced by a select few? Was it a tradition associated with an established mystery cult? Where were the few if there were only a few who practiced this tradition? Or was it a literary tradition, i.e. more of a creative practice than a practical one? I have so many questions, and I've now read an absolute ton on the subject. So instead of making any hard and fast claims on this front, even though I might have suggested some last week before I'd actually read all this research, I'm going to share with you some of what exists from the tradition itself. What are the actual ancient sources? Just how fragmentary are they? And what are the theories on what those sources might have been intending? Through these fragmentary sources, the interpretation of them, and the next two episodes on stories from the Orphic tradition, what I will end up sharing with you all is a completely alternate and fascinating ancient Greek theogony. Mythology broadly. Even some concepts of death, death practices, and the afterlife. But most of all, I will open so many questions that none of us will be able to answer. It's going to be worth all the confusion, I promise. There's a good quote explaining this confusion and uncertainty from one of the main books I'm using. The author is Dwayne Meisner, and you can find details in the episode's description. He says, quote, In general, most scholars aim for the middle road, rejecting the existence of Orphic communities, but accepting that in some way, the texts ascribed to Orpheus were written for and used in a ritual context, closely related to some of the mystery cults. With that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff, the weird stuff, the absolutely baffling stuff that is the Orphic tradition. What little we have that relates to Orpheus and the Orphic tradition comes from all over the ancient Mediterranean world in terms of both time period and region. And I mean all over. That is part of what makes it all so fascinating. As the translation of the Orphic hymns I'm using notes about just one other type of Orphic evidence, it dates from, quote, 400 BC to 200 CE, found from Rome to Asia Minor, from Macedonia to Crete. The Orphic tradition, though mysterious as fuck, we know spanned all over and probably at least about a thousand years. When I say Orphic tradition too, here's what I mean. A tradition of stories and hymns, rituals, and possibly maybe even some kind of cult practice or relationship to existing mystery cults, all revolving around Orpheus, Dionysus, and the Underworld. And the idea that Orpheus was the original author of these stories and hymns. That he lived and carried this tradition with him, sharing it through oral storytelling before it was written down by anonymous authors who attributed their own writings to Orpheus. He serves as a kind of prophet, as some would call him, or a Homeric figure if you're landing on the side of this tradition as more of a typical oral storytelling situation. But poet or prophet... Either way, it all comes from Orpheus and features the afterlife and Dionysus quite heavily. Mm, maybe. There are also theories that the underworld and maybe even Dionysus connections aren't absolute. That maybe that's something that modern scholarship has put on the Orphic tradition broadly. That maybe it was just a tradition of rituals, prayers, poetry, hymns related to the underworld, but not as directly as we think. Yeah, it's, it's confusing. You'll see what I mean. The oldest surviving piece of Orphic anything is called the Derveni Papyrus. It is a partially burned fragment of papyrus from the 4th century BCE 
and was discovered in the remains of a funeral pyre, something kind of cool enough in itself. But add to that that it is also the oldest surviving piece of papyrus from Greece, and you've got a very exciting little document. What's written on it are, like I said, the earliest surviving fragments of Orphic anything. Orphic poetry, to be specific, but also it's a kind of philosophic examination of that Orphic poetry. And it seems the poetry itself might be from as early as the 6th century BCE. Meanwhile, the person writing this papyrus is examining that poem probably in the 4th century BCE. <sighs> there are layers. Basically, it was like a philosopher or a specialist in Orphic ritual, or both, commenting on the poetry itself, like annotating it, taking notes. He was writing his thoughts about this existing poetry, which is a bit of a goldmine because we get some of the poetry and we get a real ancient person's thoughts and insights on that poetry. This anonymous author, this philosopher or specialist, according to Meisner, quote, argues that Orpheus's intention was to reveal great truths through his poetry to those who can interpret the enigmas properly. And honestly, there is just so, so much to be gleaned from this papyrus and from varied scholars' interpretations of it. But it is very complicated, and I just can't do it justice here. The author speaks of people going through rites, attempting to acquire some kind of divine knowledge, but he's also critiquing how it's handled and how they've come away without what they hoped for. There's so much, including specifically in this Meisner book, talk of ritual specialists in the Orphic tradition that were paid by individuals and cities to lead rituals and sacrifices. Plato speaks of the same thing, and both he and this author of the papyrus seem to critique the use of these specialists, how they could lead people astray. Though the unknown author, more specifically, speaks of the way these people, these specialists he's talking about, denigrate the actual Orphic poetry and rituals. Like, he's maybe a specialist himself, he's an initiate or a follower of this Orphic tradition, but he's judging how others have taken advantage of it. At least, honestly, I think that's what's happening. Again, this is, is very heavy and detailed content and very academic, and I'm trying to make it to digestible to both myself and you. It's confusing, but, but very, very cool. The poem itself, the author explains, is not secret, but it is intentionally written as an enigma, written specifically to ensure that non-initiates will not understand its true intention, whereas those who are initiated, those who are in this Orphic cult, if that was a thing and whatever it was, they would understand the intentions. It's an interesting take on more traditional ideas of mystery rituals. Here it's as though there aren't any true mysteries. They're, they aren't being kept secret, like, say, the Eleusinian mysteries were kept literally secret. But rather, there are just these sacred truths that are to be found within the poetry that are only known to those who have been initiated. So it's fine to share the poetry out loud, to share it publicly, to share anything out loud, because... Only those in the know will know the significance. Only they will know the mysteries and everyone else will just see what's on the surface level. It's kind of beautiful and super unique. And a quick reminder, too, that mystery cults in the ancient world were, like, broadly just cults of worship whose practices were kept secret, only known to those initiated. The word cult here, too, doesn't mean what we think of it now. It just means like a group of people taking part in organized rituals and practices. There were cults for most of the gods, actually. Just practices and rituals specific to those gods. Mystery cults were like that. We just don't know what they were actually doing because they kept it a, a mystery. And the Orphic cult, if there was one wasn't the same as a mystery cult necessarily. It has some associations with the mystery cult of Dionysus, but that comes later. We'll kind of get there. It, it's confusing. 
As for the content of the poem itself, this Derveni papyrus, it's very fragmentary. And it seems that any translation is, is also like hotly debated. I haven't been able to find any kind of conclusive translation or just even like a full translation beyond bits and pieces that are examined in the books that I'm reading. So we won't go into too much detail here, but the idea behind what exists in this Derveni poem is a kind of alternate theogony to the traditional story of Hesiod. This will become a running theme, too. If Orphic tradition has anything like a theme, it's a lot of these different theogonies, these origins, that include many interesting and bizarre details that veer off from the Hesiodic one that we know, and instead often have connections to the East, to Hittite and Babylonian mythologies and beyond. The stories were heavily, heavily influenced by the cultures east of Greece. And in this fragment, Night is the primordial mother, rather than Gaia. She is the first being. That's kind of Orphic in itself. It also appears to include the traditional castration of Uranus, but with the added horror show detail of Zeus swallowing Uranus's phallus. Yeah. Enjoy that bit. Better still, that's the bit that comes from the Eastern mythology, and according to Meisner, can be compared to the Hurrian Hittite myth, in which the, a god Kumarbi swallows the god Am's genitals. This really just serves to solidify Zeus's rule and make him even more important, like even more powerful. Zeus has, in essence, swallowed the universe and made himself both the first and last born king. He's made himself kind of like everything by doing this. Now, swallowing all or part of one's relatives is, as you well know, a common part of the Theogony of Hesiod, too. Kronos swallows his children, and Zeus swallows Metis, allowing for the birth of Athena. Then, here, we have his swallowing of his ancestor and making himself his own son in the process. And swallowing in this way was also common in the Mesopotamian myths, as I mentioned earlier. And Meisner goes on into so much detail on this that I can't, I can't fully get into it here. But this tradition is common across mythologies of the ancient Mediterranean and beyond, and is typically used as a way of securing power after the gods have attained it. It's symbolic in a way that I hadn't quite thought about myself. The gods are making themselves their own parents and their own children. It kind of acts like a hard reset on the mythology. That's what makes this Orphic theogony unique. It's not only rewriting the traditional mythology that is most familiar, but it's changing the order of succession of the gods. The act of swallowing something into one's stomach, in essence, acts as a pregnancy. So suddenly, Zeus is first not only in power, but also in like the timeline itself. He makes himself a supreme, like, original ruler in a way that he is just not in the Hesiodic Theogony. I've been reading another scholar writing on this papyrus for this theory that I just mentioned. His name is Bernabe. That's French. I'm going to mispronounce it. But <laughs> the article is listed in the episode's description, and, and he puts it so clearly. Quote, in the world of the gods who are immortal, the god coming afterwards is less important than his predecessor. By swallowing, that is, by taking into his entrails the penis of the first god, Uranus, in this interpretation, Zeus becomes a kind of father, or better, mother, of him, a being that biologically precedes him and thus he becomes the first, not only in the hierarchy, but the first in the genealogical order of the gods. So Zeus restarts history. End quote. Wasn't that so good? I am perpetually in awe of just how weird the mythology can get. Like, I thought I had a very, very good grasp on the level of weird that exists. It could and does exist. And, and yet here we have this Orphic tradition, just this one bit starting it off, just blowing it all out of the water. And it's only going to get weirder next week. And for all I mentioned the connections with the Eastern mythologies of the time, 
The wonderful Michaela, who helped so much with this research, also shared with me a much, much more local story that shares similarities. At least one or many of the local bands of indigenous peoples where I live in the Pacific Northwest have a story of Raven stealing the sun, where Raven, a trickster, transforms himself into a pine needle that is floating in water, which is drank by the daughter of an old man who possessed the sun, who then becomes pregnant with the child that is Raven, thus kind of rebirthing him. The way these kinds of human stories span time and continents is just, it's always so humbling. So I just had to share that one too. But shifting back to the Derveni papyrus, from here, more of the origin of everything is described. But again, it's so fragmentary that it's difficult to piece together what's actually happening. Instead, I'm going to tear myself away from that Derveni papyrus, because it is only the first of many alternate ideas of the theogony that exist in the Orphic tradition. You can read more about it if you want. Again, so many sources in the episode's description. This one, though, is the oldest that we have, and the one that includes this kind of philosophical discussion of the poetry within it, and that in itself is just so interesting. Don't worry, though. We will revisit the alternate theogonies, known as the Orphic theogonies, because they are wild, and there are also sources that provide more detail and aren't quite so fragmentary. But today, I just want to explain the overall Orphic of it all. The surviving sources on the Orphic tradition are both fragmentary and broad. They contain a kind of alternate version of, well, Greek mythology itself, like I said, primarily revolving around versions of Dionysus and brand new gods that are introduced in these alternate theogonies, stories of the origins of everything that differ greatly from the commonly understood story of Hesiod, the one I've told you many times in many forms. But there are also gold tablets that are often thought to be Orphic, that include afterlife instructions. And there are hymns to the gods, and even a story of the Argonauts centering Orpheus. Personally, I'd always been under the impression that the tradition revolved mostly around the underworld and the afterlife, because of new characters like Zagreus, who I'll talk about in detail next week. But a cursory Google of this phrase would tell you that, yes, the myth of Zagreus and the underworld is central to the entire religion of Orphism. But that seems to be a very skewed and dated claim. Not to say those things weren't a big part of the Orphic tradition, but there's just so much more to it than that. And most importantly, there's no sourcing on the story of Zagreus from the early period of this tradition, when we know that the Orphic tradition was a thing that was referenced elsewhere, that it was broadly understood and accepted, even like brought up by people like Plato. During that time, we've got no Zagreus, so it had to have revolved around something else. As for the sourcing we do have, the fragmentary bits that we know to definitely be Orphic in nature, in fact, not even a majority of those revolve around the underworld. It's mentioned, sure, and so is the origin of Zagreus, but there's no clear indication that either of those pieces were like the point or the centrality of the tradition. Does that make sense? The connection is most clear in the famous gold tablets that have been found across the Greek world and beyond, and that include instructions for the afterlife. They appear to be pretty broadly accepted to be Orphic in nature, and absolutely do revolve around the afterlife and instructions very specifically, but there is also debate as to whether these can be confirmed to be from the Orphic tradition. <laughs> I know. In the definite Orphic hymns, which again come very late, there are hymns to Chthonic deities, that is, underworld deities, which I will tell you about, and some bits of poetry that deal in the fate of souls in the underworld. And there are the Orphic bone tablets. They have words like life, death, life, 
and Dionysus Orphic inscribed on them, which suggests this association with Dionysus and the Orphic tradition, specifically Orpheus and the cult of Dionysus, but also the connection between Orpheus and a concern with life after death, the existence of an afterlife, and an interest in one's own afterlife. Of course, like I've said, Orpheus does have this inherent connection with the underworld due to his search for Eurydice, and we'll talk more about that in an episode breaking down the Orphic hymns and other surviving bits of myth. But still, the majority of the Orphic tradition tends towards the Theogonies, and broadly just hymns to many gods, both traditionally Greek and some from the East. That isn't to say that the Zagreus myth wasn't a huge part of the tradition or that the tradition didn't concern itself with life after death, but the centrality of it is up for debate. Depending on who you're reading, which scholar that is, not necessarily which ancient source or fragment, the definition of what makes something Orphic also seems to vary greatly. Is it because that piece deals in something like morality, a question of goodness and purity and how that translates to one's afterlife? Or is that a Christocentric reading of the sourcing? Or rather instead, is something defined as Orphic because it is broadly, and to put it very simply, weird, bizarre, strange, alien to the traditional Greek myth. For multiple obvious reasons, I prefer the latter definition. And boy, will I come back to what it means that a reading of Orphism can be Christocentric. Whew, revolving around the idea of a some proto-Christianity, a Christianity before Christianity, and how that ultimately just results in more of the same nonsense when it comes to so-called Western civilization, and it's often supremely problematic connections with ancient Greece. And completely selfishly, I love the idea of defining Orphic tradition as simply weird and alien, because fuck if that isn't more fun for me. But so how do we get to this idea that the Orphic tradition was primarily concerned with the afterlife, when the actual evidence that we know of as Orphic for sure, and by that I mean sources that reference Orpheus or call themselves Orphic, doesn't actually tend to concern itself with that afterlife? Well, I think it comes back to just what we know about Orpheus. He traveled to the underworld and back. He had this catabasis and he learned a few things down there. So between that and this later connection between Zagreus and his mother Persephone, which I will get to in detail next week, we have this combining of ideas that end up pointing towards the underworld and the afterlife, even if all the bits and pieces don't necessarily do that explicitly. And that's why the study of Orphic tradition seems to be so disjointed, and why so many scholars have so many different ideas when it comes to what does and does not count as Orphic, what the tradition did and did not concern itself with, and so much more. I, I can't possibly attempt to go through all of it, all the different questions and answers and what have you with you right now, but I wanted to get the general ideas, or rather the general contradictions, across, because I think that's fascinating in itself. The questions that remain about the ancient world are the best part, you know? Because we can theorize and imagine and learn more that clarifies some things or makes them more confusing. We can start to look at things through different lenses as we as humans evolve. We can start to realize where old biases may have come in, where they may have really affected the way we understand something. And when we recognize those biases, suddenly the sourcing itself, the evidence we do have, looks completely different. I haven't landed on any conclusions myself when it comes to this Orphic question, but I've absolutely loved trying to parse through all the questions being asked and the answers being posited. Which leads this rambling lesson on Orphic everything that I've thrown at you all at once in a way that I hope is at least vaguely comprehensible to one of the most fascinating things to come out of my researching these Orphic traditions. At least I think it's one of the most fascinating bits. It seems like for a few hundred years, until maybe the last century, the understanding of Orphic tradition has revolved around the idea that maybe it was some kind of proto-Christianity. Because it was most popular and most broadly understood just before Christianity started to take over, and that the story of Zagreus, that I will tell you in more detail next week, includes the idea of original sin and the atoning for it. And because of this, everything continued to revolve around that pre-existing idea, 
making it stronger and stronger because everyone was working off of that flawed, already in itself Christocentric concept. Of course, it, it doesn't inherently include anything like that, anything like original sin, because that wasn't the type of thing that they were concerned with. It's only if you read it through a Christian lens that you can even get the idea. As I mentioned earlier, it seems pretty hotly debated these days as to whether or not there was any kind of organized Orphism. That is, a religious sect in ancient Greece who got together to perform Orphic rituals, some kind of like organized religion almost. But that there were people who performed Orphic rituals themselves outside of any kind of actual religious sect is widely accepted. This might sound like a contradictory idea, so I'm, I'm going to try to break it down. Basically, it comes down to some kind of organization. Was there a group, an actual sect or cult that included membership and initiation and again, organization in order to perform these rituals and exist in this distinct group? Whereas individual people performing their own rituals and rites using the Orphic texts is a different thing and appears pretty concrete. Up until fairly recently, it was pretty broadly believed that there was an official organized group, a mystery cult essentially, that worshipped these ideas and performed these rituals and broadly believed in this very unique take on the pantheon of gods. Honestly, that's what I thought based on my cursory understanding of this tradition. And that, what's interesting too, though, is, is a lot of that understanding seems to also come with this acceptance that this mystery religion, this kind of semi-official orphism, also came with this idea of original sin, based on aspects of the story that we will cover next week. But as you might imagine now, that sort of interpretation is totally based in notions of Christianity and a general Christocentrism. People reading their own Christianity into the ancient world. Add to that that early ideas of Orphism linked it very directly to early Christianity because these are like Byzantine people in a newly Christian world looking at something that was pretty recent. But all of this seems to exist without foundation. And, and so what you've got is a whole mess of melding ancient Greek traditions with ideas of Christianity and its history. Then you have scholars later trying to break it down, pointing out that the Zagreus story does not inherently contain any kind of original sin or morality broadly. It isn't functioning in the way Christianity does, even if people wanted it to. It all comes back to something I like to talk about a lot. The underworld is not a place for punishment. It isn't like the Christian idea of hell. And calling it that, or equating the two, is placing modern ideas of Christianity into this ancient tradition. A, a culture that existed long, long before Christianity. There isn't any inherently moral purpose in the stories of the underworld. It's just where you go when you die. In the case of some of these Orphic or possibly Orphic tablets, there were instructions, sure, but they also aren't moral in nature. They're not like, be good and you'll go to a good place. They're like, hey, make sure you talk to these people at the spring of memory. Or like, hey, tell Persephone I said hi. Okay, that one isn't real, but it's close enough. It still conveys the overall purpose that these are practical instructions and pieces of guidance. They're not judgments or instructions on behavior. They're not moral in nature. There's a great quote about this in the Meisner book that I'm consulting. Quote, It was expected that Orphism, seen as a sort of proto-Christianity, would be concerned with such concepts as original sin and the afterlife, that mystery cults would offer salvation from an afterlife of punishment, and that these ideas would revolve around the story of a god who was killed and brought back to life. Sound familiar? <laughs> and there's another by Edmonds, another person working on this subject. Sources in the episode's description. But he's quoting somebody else, though. Quote, even Guthrie, perhaps the most careful and self-conscious about not applying a Christian model to the ancient religions he studied, admits, We are brought up in an atmosphere of Christianity, and whether we like it or not, Christian notions of behavior have sunk into the very marrow of our thought and expression. Christianity really weasels its way into everything, doesn't it? I mean, no offense to weasels. <laughs> 
or Christians, fine. But for real, it's both shocking and not at all shocking to me that this was how the study of Orphism existed for so long. They wanted to see Christian ideals in the story. And by they, I mean Western people who are, like he was saying in that quote, brought up in Christianity. And so they just did see these references. And then their own confirmation bias meant that everything continued to revolve around those ideas. Everything had to connect to the underworld, the afterlife, and Zagreus, and then Orpheus too, with some kind of morality, even when it likely didn't have that at all. And so, because of this Christian idea and how it affected the scholarship, the story of Dionysus Zagreus becomes seen as more important than it actually was. It becomes a central myth, central story, because it had an already misplaced moral context, one that didn't exist. In actuality, it seems this story was just probably one of many. It was just an origin story, like any other in Greek myth. Just an explanation for how this form of Dionysus was born and reborn and reborn again. <laughs> Next week, that story, as it appears in the most detailed version from the 5th century CE in, coincidentally enough, a Christian world. <laughs> Though the story itself, the epic rather, isn't Christian at all. It's that Dionysiaca that I've told you about by a man named Nonus. It's the longest surviving epic of Greek myth, and boy, is it something. And the week after, whew, those alternate theogonies and more on the Orphic hymns and gold tablets. They will be more traditional episodes that will make more sense. I promise. Oh, nerds, did that make any sense? <laughs> I sure hope it did. I can't tell you how many times I read and reread the script or how I questioned whether I'm assuming too much pre-existing knowledge. That's because I've been working on it so much, so now I have this pre-existing knowledge, so have I assumed any of it in this script? Because the hardest thing for me lately, because I've been doing this so long now, is that so much of it lives inside my head that I now have trouble remembering what lives inside of other normal people's heads. People who don't spend every waking moment reading and researching Greek mythology. What's that like, anyway? To have, like, other things existing in your brain? Sometimes I miss that feeling. Anyway, researching this has been so much more difficult than I expected, and so much more interesting, fine, whatever. But please don't take any of this as an absolute truth about the Orphic tradition. I am doing my best, with limited sources and even less time. I couldn't read the entire books on the subject and just had to piece through trying to glean as much context as possible from as many different sources and then trying to make those sources as broad as possible, but honestly I had to rely a lot on this Meisner book, which seems amazing to my untrained eye and is certainly academic in nature. But man, if you look up Orphism on, say, like, Wikipedia, there's so much weird shit that I never even came across. And then all those sources that are more hundred, uh, hundreds of dollar books, so I can't look into them further. And it seems like a lot of people, what people know on the subject, too, is from ancient and not-so-ancient philosophers talking about it. And a lot of that is purported to be older than it actually is. And, like, there's Neoplatonists from the 6th century CE, which is pretty useless given how much Christianity would have taken over by then and how problematic pagan religions were. And then even the, if the people were writing about these things, they didn't think badly of them. They're dealing with their own biases. And, and then you have modern biases and future further Christian biases. It's just endless. Anyway, I did my best. I would absolutely love, love, love to have an expert on the show to talk about the messiness that is the Orphic tradition, or maybe just Orphic question. I, I, I'd love to have them come on and tell me everything I missed or got wrong, all the alternate possibilities and scholarship, but I don't currently have anyone lined up. Are you an expert on those things? Would you like to come on and have a chat and share your knowledge with my many listeners? If yes, please head to mythsbaby.com slash contact. There's a link to a form I use to track people interested in being guests on the show. I would love to have you. Or do you have a suggested guest? Feel free to share it with me on Twitter. This is such a niche and specific topic, it isn't supremely easy to find somebody to speak to it. All right, anyway, that's enough for me. Whew, Orpheus has smushed my brain into a jelly. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and researched the hell out of this topic. I will be forever grateful to her. She even proofread this script because I was like, what is it? What am I doing? Does it make sense? Whew. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. I am Liv and I really, really love the other ancient sources that I understand. I can't believe I'd ever say I miss Hesiod, but here we are. Mm -hmm.